Mio is the 19-year-old daughter of Shinichi Saimori, the head of a prominent family. After her stepmother gave birth to her sister Kaya, Mio was cast aside. One day, Mr. Tatsuishi visits their home, and the servants gossip about the possibility of a marriage between the families. Koji, the youngest son, approaches Mio as she sweeps. He's there with his parents for the heads of family meeting, and is happy for the opportunity to spend some time with Mio. They've known each other for a long time. He knows how she's treated and has always wished to save her from it. Soon after, Mio's father asks her what she usually does around midday. She politely responds that she cleans, which would be obvious to anyone paying even an iota of attention to her life. He asks that she make herself available the day after next at midday. That night, she wonders why he would even waste his breath with a request like that. She's treated like a servant anyway and never leaves. Two days later, Kaya taunts her older sister for having soot on her face. She hadn't noticed, having spent all morning doing chores. Kaya laughs and says she better not greet their guests like that. Mio averts her gaze and apologizes. Later, she spots Koji wearing Western clothes and compliments him, but something's clearly weighing on him. He tells her he has an important matter to discuss with her father. He hands her a box of sweets, asks her to share it with everyone, and walks away. Mr. Saimori requests her presence in the parlor. On her way there, she remembers what her father said and wonders if it's a marriage proposal from Koji, but tells herself not to get her hopes up. When she arrives, Koji can't look her in the eye. Her father announces the union of the Tatsuishi and Saimori families. Koji will be welcomed into their home with Kaya as his wife. Koji looks devastated, while pure shock flashes on Mio's face. Kaya laughs to herself, while they fight back tears. But her father isn't finished. He reveals that Mio will be married off to the Kudo family. Kaya and her mother taunt Mio, telling her that Kyoko Kudo is too good for her and she should be grateful. Her father tells her to gather her things. She'll be leaving tomorrow. Mio grabs an umbrella, because it must be raining at a moment like this, and goes out to her mother's cherry tree, or the stump that remains of it, to say goodbye. Koji goes outside to join her. The rain mixes with the tears falling on his button-down shirt as he apologizes. But Mio tells him it's all right. It isn't his fault, and she could never blame him. Kaya smugly cuts their conversation short just to give the knife in her back a little twist. That night, while she packs, a servant brings her a new kimono that her father arranged for her to properly present herself at the Kudo residence. She notices how little Mio has to pack. Mio explains that most of her mother's things were thrown out. The servant cautions her that Kyoka Kudo is said to be uncaring and merciless. He's already driven away other fiancés and warns her to be careful. The next day, Mio sets off and reflects on the nightmare she's finally escaped from while riding the train alone. After the morning's journey, she knocks on the door of what is to be her new home, and Yori, a servant, lights up when she introduces herself and invites her in. She tells Mio that the young master is in the study and beckons her to follow. When they arrive, Mio bows and introduces herself. Kiyoka gruffly asks how long she's going to keep her head down. When she raises her head, she sees he's turned to face her, and is instantly able to perceive something beautiful in him beyond the rumors about his temperament. She allows herself to feel the moment for what it is, a pivot in her life from the stagnation of what it was to a realm of new possibilities. It may not be perfect, but for the first time in a long time, she has a reason to be optimistic. Kiyoka introduces himself and declares his absolute authority over the household. If he asks her to die, she dies, no questions asked. Mio quietly but assuredly agrees. Her instant dedication catches him off guard. She then asks if there's anything else that she should know about, and even thanks him for teaching her the law of the land. That night, Yuri shows her to her room and tells her that rumors about Kiyoka are a bit overblown. Sure, he can be curt and authoritative, but there's a real kindness behind it. Mio appreciates the encouragement but she's concerned about her own desirability. Her family has a reputation for their strong connection to the supernatural, and she assumes this is what makes her eligible. She dreams about her childhood and how her father tested her and her sister for having spirit sight. Kaya seemed to have it, but Mio did not, 
and this is considered an important indicator about whether they would develop still stronger abilities. This result is what led to her neglect and mistreatment growing up. She wakes up early and figures she'd better get to work to prove her usefulness. Yuri walks into the kitchen to see Mio preparing breakfast. She tells the young woman that she doesn't need to worry about putting herself to work, but also that the assistance is appreciated. When she presents the food to Kiyoka, Yuri makes it a proud point to tell him that Mio prepared it. He responds by demanding that Mio taste it first. She's taken aback, and when she doesn't immediately do so, Kiyoka tells her to try harder next time if she wants to poison him, and walks out. Mio sits there in a daze, not even sure of what just happened. Later, Kiyoka addresses the new recruits of the special anti-grotesquerie unit. He expects them to hone their supernatural prowess telekinesis, pyrokinesis, clairvoyance, and other gifts. Grotesqueries, like demons and spirits, have plagued the land since time immemorial. Supernatural abilities are the first and the last line of defense against such threats. Some of the recruits wonder what they're even doing there, many of them never having seen any themselves. Kiyoka quickly gets their attention with an ice blast. He admits that it may be rare for them to be called upon, but their preparedness to respond is of no less importance. Afterwards, his special aide pops into his office to deliver some papers. Kiyoka ignores him, until he teases him about whether his latest fiancé has already fled, then quickly flees himself when the irritated and probably hungry commander threatens to kill him if he doesn't leave him to his work. Kiyoka thinks back to that morning when Yori uncharacteristically defended Mio. That evening, Mio apologizes profusely for her blunder in the morning. Though keeping his walls up, Kiyoka does try to lessen the blow by saying he really didn't believe she poisoned the meal. He was just hesitant to eat food prepared by a stranger. After dinner, prepared by Yori and Yori alone, she tries to make up for it and offers to draw him a hot bath. He refuses, but logistically this time, It'd be silly to put her through the effort of starting the fire when one of his abilities is pyrokinesis. This only draws Mio's attention to her own lack of special abilities, feeling just as useless as ever. While she cleans up, he actually apologizes for not eating her breakfast that morning, but through the door and not face to face. He also tells her that Yori will be late the following morning, so she's in charge of breakfast, but any hint of poison and she's done. That night, Mio has another bad dream about the abuse she suffered as a child, but remembers a servant, Hana, who had always been kind to her. She was fired for standing up for Mio against her stepmother on the day Mio discovered all of her mother's remaining possessions had been removed, presumably thrown out. She wonders how Hana's doing now. When she goes to make breakfast in the morning, Yori shows up early. Mio is confused, but Yori laughs it off saying he should have just said he wanted to eat her food instead, and helps her prepare breakfast. When they sit down to eat, Kiyoka is pleased with how good the food is, but becomes concerned when Mio starts crying. She's never been praised like that before. While he gets ready for work, he asks Yori about what she thinks of Mio's upbringing. She's from a prominent family, but they both agree that all signs point to her being treated as a servant. He asks Yori to keep a close eye on her, while he looks directly into the Saimori family. Of course she'll look after her. Yori has a good feeling about this one, but he's still trying to conceal what he's really thinking. At the Saimori residence, Mio's father has an argument over the phone. He's accused of breaking a promise that Mio would marry into the Tatsuishi family. She has the blood of the Usuba family, making her extremely valuable. One day, Kiyoka tells Mio that he's going into town. She asks what she should do to prepare meals for him, and he says, nothing, she's going with him. This takes her by surprise. She doesn't have any reason to go and worries she'll only get in the way, but he tells her that she doesn't need a reason, nor will she be a bother. He wants her to go with him. Yori checks up on her while she gets ready. She uncovers the full-length mirror in her room and encourages her to indulge in the process. She asks her about whether she'll be using any makeup, but she never has and wouldn't even know what to do with it, so Yuri offers to help. Kiyoka responds favorably to seeing her all dolled up, but doesn't linger on the subject, and the two set off for town. He parks the car at his workplace, and Godo, his special aide, notices them and asks about who his companion is, 
but Kyoka firmly tells him to stay out of his private life and sends him away. When they get to town, he asks if she needs anything, but she can't think of anything, so he says she can simply accompany him on his errands. He tells her not to worry so much and caresses her head. She wonders where all the rumors about him are coming from. He's been nothing but kind after the initial non-attempt to poison him. Elsewhere, Mr. Saimori meets with Mr. Tatsuishi and tries to feign ignorance regarding their deal, citing the offer from the Kudo family that he couldn't refuse. Despite her mother being from the Usuba family, Mio didn't inherit any supernatural abilities. Her father finally concedes that he can have her when the Kudo family tosses her away, and that he's all but abandoned her. Tatsuishi is resolved to get Usuba blood into his family line. Kaya waits outside and demands a servant tell her what the two are meeting about. She's furious to learn that Mio is the topic of discussion. Koji rounds the corner and tries to calm her down by suggesting they go to town and check out the new department store that opened up. She begrudgingly agrees. Kiyoka takes Mio to a kimono shop that his family has been going to forever. Yori had noticed that she's been trying to hide the fact that she repairs her clothes, what little she has. The seamstress shows him some selections she's made based on his request. He notices a beautiful cherry blossom patterned fabric and asks her to make one using that in addition to all of her recommendations. The seamstress tells him to hold on to her, the first woman he's ever brought into her shop. They stop to enjoy some sweets. Kiyoka mentions that he's never seen her smile and would like to. She's embarrassed and thinks his way of making conversation is a bit strange and ends up apologizing again. Since they're supposed to get married, if all things go well, he wants her honest opinions, not apologies. She still worries that he'll throw her out when he finds out she doesn't have any supernatural abilities, though. Yori catches Kiyoka putting a box outside Mio's door while she bathes. When she gets out and opens the box, she rushes in to tell him she can't accept such an expensive gift, but he isn't having it and tries to play it down. It's a new comb one to replace her mother's, which she kept despite her father's new wife breaking it when she was a child. Yori is over the moon about it, since giving one as a gift is akin to a marriage proposal, but he's adamant that it doesn't mean anything beyond any other gift he could have given. Mio thanks him and promises to cherish it, and even shows him a bit of that smile he was looking for. At work, the man Kiyoka hired to look into Mio and her family relays how her stepmother and sister abused her both for not having supernatural abilities and for simply being the product of Shinichi's previous marriage. He also divulges that her mother was an Usuba, which takes him by surprise. Members of that family are hard to find, and it's said that the family's ability makes them capable of interfering with people's minds. On the way to his car, he feels that something's not right and launches a fiery tornado into the sky. A flock of paper cranes ignite and fall to the ground simple shikigami, likely being used to spy on him. Mio approaches Yori for advice on getting a gift for Kiyoka to thank him for the comb. She drops everything in excitement to help. She doesn't have much money to buy him something, so Yori suggests she makes something and finds her a book on handicrafts. Mio decides to make him a braided cord to wear in his hair. Before he heads to work, Mio asks her fiancé if it's alright if she runs an errand while he's out. A bit concerned, he suggests she wait to do it another day so they can go together, but she assures him that Yori will be with her, so it'll be fine. He agrees, though still a bit reluctant, and gives her an amulet, insisting that she carry it at all times. Oblivious to this attempt to protect her, she agrees, happy to receive another gift from her husband-to-be. Koji sulks about his situation when his older brother shows up to tease him about his new fiancé, just to rub some salt in it maintaining that big brother tradition. Yori and Mio head to town and pick out some materials to make her gift. Preparing to head back, Yori remembers that she needs to pick up some salt and tells Mio to wait for her. She hears Kaya's voice, and terror washes over her face as she spots her and Koji standing a few meters away. It turns out Kiyoka's itinerary included a stop at the Saimori residence. He meets with Mio's father and stepmother, hoping to establish an understanding between them. He tells them that he intends to go through with the marriage, and despite these types of arrangements usually being power moves between families, Kiyoka wants to make clear that he harbors reservations regarding reciprocation. 
He knows what they did to her and wants nothing to do with them. He makes one concession, however. He'll pay her dowry in exchange for a sincere apology for putting her through hell. If they refuse, then he cuts ties outright. Back in town, Kaya terrorizes her sister, thinking Kyoka abandoned her already because she's wearing her old kimono in town. She begins to gloat. Mio can't get a word out. Luckily, Yori comes to the rescue and reveals that she and Kyoka are to be married, making Mio a soon-to-be lady. Kaya is dumbfounded and angry that her sister will be above her station. When they get home, Mio is despondent. Yori brings her concerns to Kyoka. He wonders what he can do about her confidence. Yori tells him to simply show compassion, something she's lacked for years. He sits at his writing desk and composes a letter. Sometime later, Hana visits, and Mio is overjoyed to see the only real friend she had growing up. She learns that Kiyoka was the one who wrote the letter inviting her, and his aide Godo gave her the ride. This tips her off that he knows more than he's letting on. She takes the gift she made and goes to tell him the truth. Everything is laid bare. She explains her upbringing and lack of supernatural ability. She apologizes for not telling him sooner and understands if he wishes her dead or gone from his sight. But lastly, and before he decides, she presents the braided cord hair tie she made for him. He dispels her worries and tells her he intends to make their engagement official as soon as possible and asks her to tie off his hair with his new cherished gift. While saying goodbye to Hana out front, a handful of shikigami hover above, just out of sight. Mr. Tatsuishi has been the one spying on them, and he's furious to learn that the Usuba bloodline is out of his grasp, but he's far too cunning and devious to chalk it up as fate. Mr. Tatsuishi meets with Kaya regarding what to do about the Mio situation. He shows her a picture of her and Kiyoka together, and she recognizes him from his visit to the Saimori residence. She can't accept Mio's success with a fiancé so much higher in status than her own, and resolves to confront their father about swapping fiancés. Mr. Tatsuishi revels in how easily she's manipulated. Meanwhile, Mio prepares a dinner for Kiyoka and Godo to thank them for arranging Hana's visit. When they arrive, Kiyoka is taken with his fiancé's beauty, and Godo suddenly feels like a third wheel. Kaya uses a shikigami to spy on her sister, fueling her rage. They sit down to eat, and Godo truly enjoys the meal and has a bit too much to drink. When Mio sincerely thanks him for helping facilitate Hana's visit, he jokingly asks her to marry him instead of his fiendish commander. Kyoka chokes on his drink and yells at him. After dinner, they get a tipsy Godo a ride home. At the Saimori residence, Kaya pleads with her father, but he tells her to forget about Mio. The whiny brat insists that she's more worthy of marrying into the Kudo family, but her father won't have it and tells her to train to be a better wife if she has so much free time. So Kaya heads over to Koji and tries to play on his feelings for Mio to get him on board for her master plan. Mio has another dream. This time, figures shrouded in shadow surround her and push her into the same nightmarish memories of her past. Kyoka hears her whimpering and discovers her passed out on the table muttering in her sleep. He senses the residue of supernatural abilities, despite the barrier around the house remaining intact. He wonders what this means and wakes her up. He tells her that if anything unusual happens, she should tell him right away. The next day, Koji notices some shady guys exiting his family home and wonders what Kaya and his father are up to. Koji enters the house to find the two conspiring. He thinks they're being ridiculous. If the head of the Saimori family doesn't wish it, it's not going to happen. Kaya asks him to play along to get Mio to agree to the swap. Her father will have no choice if it's him against everyone else involved. Yori and Mio prepare a lunch to bring to Kyoka at work. He often neglects to eat when he's particularly busy. Yori suggests she use a new handbag to match her new kimono, but Mio forgets to grab the amulet from the other bag. When they get to his work, he runs outside to meet them, assuming that something's wrong. His concern washes away when he learns they merely brought him some lunch. Before they leave, he asks Mio if she has the amulet. She assures him she does, only to discover she forgot it a moment after he leaves them. Yori seems a bit frantic and says they should hurry home. 
Suddenly, the car Koji saw earlier rolls up, and two invisible men kidnap Mio and drive off, leaving Yori in the dust. Mr. Tatsuishi tells his son they can't stand idly by while Mio slips through their fingers. Koji becomes furious. The furniture in the room begins to shake with him. He uses telekinesis to fire a ball of furniture at his father. His untrained power is a pittance compared to the old man's, and he's left tied up on the floor. Koji's older brother finds him and unties him, asking if he's just going to back down after standing up to their father and failing. He resolves to not give up. Yori rushed back to Kiyoka's office to inform him about the incident. They're interrupted by a commotion in the hall. It's Koji demanding an audience. He pleads for his help, knowing he can't save Mio alone. Mio comes to and finds herself bound in a dark room. She cries out for help, and her sister opens the door to taunt her. Kiyoka races to save her with Koji, who's sure she's being held at the Saimori residence. Kaya and her mother threaten Mio's life and demand that Mio refuse Kiyoka's marriage proposal. Mio refuses them. Her stepmother strikes her. Kaya continues to tear her sister down, but Mio holds her own and continues to refuse to comply. For the first time in her life, she has something worth fighting for, and this gives her the courage to defend it. Kiyoka and Koji arrive at the gates, and when no one lets them in, Kiyoka blasts them down with lightning. Mio's stepmother continues to beat her and tear her down, but she hesitates when she hears the thunderclap. A confused Mr. Saimori rushes outside and asks Kiyoka what's going on, and is even more confused when Kiyoka asks where Mio is. Mr. Tatsuishi appears beside him, not having expected to see Kudo so soon, and tells him that he won't be seeing his fiance again. Not if he has anything to say about it, if they won't tell him where she is he'll find her using force. Still unclear about what's going on, Mr. Saimori is now forced to protect his property, and the two erect a barrier. Kiyoka doesn't even blink as he shatters their feeble attempts to stop him, and strikes down Tatsuishi with a mild lightning attack. Koji, disgusted with his father's actions, continues to assist Kiyoka. Mio continues to reject her sister's and stepmother's demands, She'll stand her ground as long as her husband-to-be believes in her. Outside, Kiyoka somehow intuits that Mio's in a storehouse. Koji confirms that there's an unused storehouse on the property, when suddenly a swirl of fire races toward them from behind. It's Mr. Tatsuishi. Kiyoka, tired of his crap, knocks him unconscious with a less mild lightning attack. The estate is in flames due to Tatsuishi's foolishness, and Mr. Saimori falls to his knees still unaware of what's really going on. Kaya is choking out a defiant Mio when the door slowly creaks open. Kiyoka stands there, staring daggers. Kaya drops Mio, and Kiyoka rushes to her aid. She thanks him for coming to save her, and slips out of consciousness. Evil stepmother becomes curious about the noise and strange glow outside, and breaks down at the sight of the fiery destruction of her home. Kaya tries to rationalize her role in all of this, claiming she didn't do anything wrong. She believes her mother's narrative about being superior to her sister, and even now she tries to make her case to Kiyoka about being the obvious better choice for him. Kiyoka just tells her to shut up, there's no way he could ever be interested in her. He picks Mio up and carries her away. Kaya starts losing it, and Koji tries to get her to leave before the place burns down. He tells her to stop it. She's right that he cares about Mio more than he'll ever care about her. But if he doesn't save her, Mio will lament her death. Mio dreams of her mother, who apologizes for all the hardship she endured because of her, and tells her to believe in her power. Elsewhere, a shrouded figure curses Tatsuishi's vain attempts to keep the Yusuba bloodline out of the Kudo family. A man bows, referring to him as Your Majesty and requests permission to enact some mysterious plan to prevent the accumulation of power, presumably that of Kudo acquiring Usuba. Later on, Mio awakens at the Kudo residence to a relieved Kiyoka. She begins to apologize, but he stops her. This isn't her fault. Yori walks in and collapses in relief to see that she's okay. 
This is the first time anyone's ever been so concerned about her. Thank you for sticking until the end. Subscribe for more videos like this.